Hey, welcome back to my channel, Jeannie Lynch. So happy that you're here today and so excited to continue the beautiful work of spiritual modalities for a spiritual life. I love this playlist. Look at all the different interviews I've done with people from around the world who have a service or a modality or a healing technique that they use to serve the clients that they work with. And I'm going to introduce you to that process, that modality today. Today, we're going to be uncovering Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, or is it the Kabbalah? Hmm. We're going to find out the right pronunciation of that word. And we're going to uncover just what that means and how can we use this ancient modality in today's world for healing? Hmm, so intrigued. Stay looking, stay watching, stay listening. I have a beautiful rabbi coming in. You're going to meet him. You're going to learn more about him, how he works, about his book, and so much more. It's an introduction to the Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism. So stay looking, stay watching, stay listening. That fun, interactive interview is coming up next. Hello! Yay! So happy that you're here. I'm going to welcome my guest today. We have Rabbi Matthew Ponak. So excited to introduce this guest to you today. We've been chatting off lines. We already feel like we're fast friends. And we're going to share his beautiful modality of Jewish mysticism and then Kabbalah or Kabbalah. I know. That's where we got to start. How do we pronounce this word? <laughs> You're going to go into all the beautiful details of you and this beautiful modality and how your modality lines up with spirituality. And I'm so excited to get to know you and hear about your book and your institute and all these great things that you have going. So welcome, welcome, Matthew. Thank you so much for having me on, Jeannie. It's a pleasure to be here. And so I'd love to to just address the topic that came up already in the intro of, of how is this word Kabbalah pronounced or is it Kabbalah? And the answer is there's many ways of pronouncing the word. It's a very ancient word and actually different cultures, certainly within the Jewish world, have pronounced it differently. So Kabbalah is more of an Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish way of pronouncing it. And in modern Hebrew today, it has a more Sephardic sound, perhaps. That was from, from Western Europe initially. It's Kabbalah. I say Kabbalah. Kabbalah most often, but it's um, it's the same thing no matter how you pronounce it. Got it. So you have this book, The Embodied Kabbalah, right? So that if we're going to talk about your book, which I see behind you, um, a lot of the things that you're going to share with us today, are they in the book or are they, we can talk a little bit more about that. But before we go there, I really want to get to know you a little bit more. We just met on sure. email through the podcast group and stuff. So I have no idea. I, I, you're in British Columbia? Is that where? Mm -hmm. Okay. I live so on Vancouver Island, which it. is a very big island. And I'm at the southern tip in a city called Victoria, which okay. is the capital of this province of British Columbia. It's a really lovely place. And it, it barely snows here. It happened to snow last night. It's the warmest spot in all of Canada and surrounded by ocean, mountain, enormous trees and forests. It's, a, it's an incredible place to live. Beautiful. Well, tell us a little bit about this modality and how you got into it. You don't, to me, you don't look like the typical rabbi. I think that we see when we think, you know, we close our eyes and think, right, what they look like with the beards. And, and so take us to how you got into this and, you know, your whole background, and then let's explore this beautiful modality together. Absolutely. Well, first off, the way that I look is probably less common in the media for rabbis, but there are more rabbis serving more congregations in, let's say, North America that look like me than, than have black hats. And in fact, most of the people I graduated from rabbinical school with weren't even men, women, non-binary folks. And that was, I was in the vast minority in my graduating class. So things are are much different in what's called the liberal Jewish world, if you will. But uh, yeah, it's in... There's a certain way that often rabbis are presented in in the larger you know media, and yeah, so yeah. maybe this is also an opportunity just to see that the other ways that rabbis can look. Yeah, I, I grew up in a relatively culturally Jewish environment. Okay. I, I went learned Hebrew growing up, had a bar mitzvah when I was thirteen, but it wasn't until I was a teenager 
when I really encountered spirituality for the first time. And it was in the context of a sort of a Jewish spirituality group for teens. And after being in that first class, I don't think I said anything the entire time, but I was just overwhelmed by how beautiful it was. And I took a took a journey for a few years of exploring my roots. I ended up in a seminary in Israel when I was 18. And I didn't know this at the time, but apparently it's possible that someone can be overwhelmed by spirituality. Something so good, it can actually, if it's not handled with caution and with care and with groundedness, that it, it can actually cause some difficulties and some fracturing. And so I had uh, quite an overwhelming time when I was there, in fact, and it took me a little while, a few years to figure out what had even happened. Oh, can I stop I, you? Can I stop yes, you there? Absolutely. I'm so I'm so intrigued by what you're saying because this you would be the first person I've ever interviewed that hasn't been through the the dark side, dark night of the soul or the spiritual awakening, and then that catapulted them into their modality or their spiritual right. And what you just described is you went kind of looking for this early on in life, which is usually when people are shutting down, 13, 14, our parents are telling us to turn it off, turn it out, you know what I mean? And get in our bodies and we start puberty and all that. But it sounds like you had this desire or this need to run, you know, dive a little bit deeper, but without the experience of like losing your parents or, you know, some tragedy that has happened, which typically ends up, I mean, none of it's wrong, right? Just, I, I love what you're saying. And so when you were away and you were uncovering this and, you know, the, the whole experience of your, I'll call it an awakening, but you can give it better language. Um, What, what was it? Was it scary for you or overwhelming in a good way, or just, you didn't know what to do with the information or the feeling? Take me there, Matthew. Well, it is an experience of falling so deeply in love with God, you could say, or the divine spirit, and then kind of getting lost in that that it was this great, beautiful, blissful, that's what I mean by overwhelming, but it's like uh, they have a metaphor in Kabbalah, which I'll sort of get to that more specifically in a little bit. The metaphor is that each of us have what are called vessels. You could say containers or like clay pots would be really the original intention of that metaphor inside of us. And they're being filled with light. And that is a really wonderful thing when we engage with our path and when we engage with spirit and transformation. However, imagine if you could overfill one of these pots, yeah. or maybe you'd overfill all of them. It's they they can break and they can even shatter. And the, the goal on some level, if they start to get a little filled up, is to take a break and to let it integrate. And they can, in fact, grow stronger in that time. But if someone's just taking in more light and more light, it can actually be shattering and that can come out. It came out for me in the form of essentially psychosis and, okay. and misunderstanding of reality. My it was like my subconscious was sort of bleeding into my conscious awareness and I wasn't able to distinguish fact from fiction for a good amount of time. Wow. What, so what'd you do next? I mean, so did that <laughs> lead you into going deeper in or taking a break and a respite and coming back and saying, and then turning it off? So were you terrified by this or were you leaning into it? I was <laughs> so in the experience there wasn't any ability to distinguish what was happening to me from reality. I couldn't, the concept of leaning in wouldn't even have made sense. I was like, I was in another, I was here in the physical world, but my mind was in another world. So I had to go home essentially uh, from Israel and through France. And, you know, it was quite a, quite a little adventure and then spending some time with mental health professionals, in fact. And at that time, no one, though they were extremely helpful for me to kind of return back to base reality, if you will, no one could tell me what had happened in a really coherent sense. And it wasn't for, I was picking up the pieces. I was learning just to take care of myself physically and gaining some emotional intelligence, which I hadn't as a teenager and those kinds of things. But it wasn't until I met a transpersonal psychologist, who's was a psychologist who specializes in mysticism and spirituality And I learned that there's such a thing called a spiritual emergency. And that is this process, which I was just describing. And I, it's, it comes in various shades and colors, but sometimes we take in so much light 
and spirit, it can actually fry our system a little bit and overwhelm us, overwhelm us. And that's, I learned a number of habits and ways of viewing that I could then relate to that part of myself without risking, without being fearful of the overwhelm and the spilling over. I just love what you're saying. I hate that you had to go through that experience, but then I'm glad I'm glad we're, what you're saying. Can I just connect and then tell me if I'm in the same space or just on the opposite side of what you said? Um, 2005, I lost my daughter in a terrible car crash and I went through my, you know, this opening and I was so in so much pain in my physical body that I was disassociating mm -hmm. and going through this whole like, it's too painful to be in my body, so I'll just leave. And so I was driving down the road and flying out involuntarily out of body and having these out of body experiences. Okay, so here's the question. At that time, I'm in therapy, right? <laughs> There's two ways to look at it. I had to, like you, get connected to someone from the spiritual side to say, oh, you're having out of body experiences and you're connecting to source and let's teach you how to go on your own and, you know, and, and, we'll do this safely. Or I could have done the medical route, which was to just put me on Xanax and medicate me because until I could get and heal. So there was these two sides that were going. So it sounds like you're really lucked out in getting connected with somebody who specialized in the spiritual side to kind of guide you through this process. Is that accurate? I am not opposed to medicine, so to speak, Western medicine as a treatment uh, if it's needed, it. I, I, in fact, benefited from both. I, 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 I have this. a fairly, everything that I do in life through largely informed by experiences like that has to do with, with balance. And there's very few things in the world. If anything, I'll say there's never a time or a place for that. But my, my, and so my suggestion for people in general is to find what works for them. Got it. Great advice. I got, and I love this conversation. Okay. So how old are you when this is all taking place? That is between the ages of 18 and 21, 22, I was picking up the pieces more. And at 22, I met this healer. Got it. And really started to reorient how I was living. And some of these things are just the most basic practices in the world. Got it. Like Got it. eating good, nourishing food, yeah. three meals a day, sleeping eight hours a day, exercising regularly. For myself, I remember uh, she said to me, "You know, you don't you don't have trouble uh, elevating and getting into high, higher, higher spaces, higher states. What your issue is, what you need to work on, and your practice should be grounding, and Got so it. staying in your body. And it was like, oh, there are different types of spiritual seekers out there. I didn't know that, Got and it. so things like that is what a lot of the learning was. And I'll fast forward a little bit. I ended up feeling after that process, very universal and not so connected to my own tradition. I had sort of, I gotten burned there, if, if you will. And there was also a certain in out dynamic. I was, I was very universal at that point in my life. I still am, okay. but I felt a call eventually after I, I went to a Buddhist university actually in, in uh, Colorado, Naropa. But when I was, when I arrived a few weeks in, I started getting these callings to become a rabbi. And it felt like really from beyond. <laughs> And it, it took me a while to even navigate all those elements, but I sort of took the plunge into rabbinical school and to, to training for a rabbi a few years later. And what embodied Kabbalah is, is I discovered that there was from the past thousand years of teachings from Jewish mysticism, there is a whole language about grounded spirituality. And all the things that I had been learning that were really healing to me, they were actually found within these sources. But no one had ever put them together before like that. I love this. Oh, I just, I loved your journey. Okay. So that's when you made the decision to kind of le lean in. Now you're leaning in, <laughs> right? Yes. Into I learned, this. Learning to lean in. It was probably a, a big part of that in general, learning okay. to lean in. So take my listeners to what that meant for you. And then 
I would love to learn more about what you do to serve the clients or the, I don't even know if you call them clients, the students, students that you clients. serve, you know? Yeah. So take us there, say, okay, Jeannie, at this point in my life, the door gets opened. I t decide to lean into this. What is this? So the people listening can go, oh my God, I've been in search for something like this myself, but is it a religion or is it not a religion? Is, is it just spirituality? Is it mysticism? What's the difference? Take us there. Yeah, these are all these terms can be used in so many ways. What I can say is that what I teach is open to anyone of any background. It, it is in the same way that people would engage with mindfulness meditation or something like that. And it, it's not here in North America. It's not what religion are you? Can you engage with mindfulness Mo most of the time that it's open to anyone? That's how that's how I teach as well from this perspective. I often am finding that the people who are most drawn to what I'm teaching have some kind of Jewish ancestry or some kind of connection in some way. They've always felt drawn to it, drawn to Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism, but they've, they're have they intimidated by going into an institutional space or they're not sure how to enter. And I often meet people who are very spiritually advanced, if you will, or alive, and they're just ready to start engaging with Kabbalah as a system of understanding their spiritual lives, for example. Okay. It, it is, among other things, there's practices involved, there's teachings about transformation, but it's also a tremendously helpful system of categorization to understand you know, what is this world? What are the different layers of reality? Where am I on my path? And what's what's next in my own transformation? Does your book embodied Kabbalah go into the systems in place? Is it is it a teaching system or is it a book about this story? Or take us to your book for I know I'm jumping on you, but I, to oh, me they're okay. connected, and I want to hear more about both. So, um, yeah. can can you explain the Kabbalah a little bit and in, in the systems in place, and then is it in your book? Okay, twofold question. Absolutely. So Kabbalah could be called Jewish mysticism. Kabbalah is sometimes referring to a specific time in the Middle Ages when a new form arose. But it also, in in my book, it's referring to the whole, uh, the whole history of Jewish spirituality. Got it. And what really this book is, it is a collection of 42 different teachings that I feel the world could really benefit from knowing. Some of these teachings have never been translated before in English and they all have not only a translation, but they have a commentary to explain what are these symbols? Because so, mystics from so many different cultures and religions, they what they're experiencing is so hard to explain sometimes, or it's so radical also that they often use metaphor and symbol. So it has the, the primary sources as well as all the explanation and, and how what's actually coming across along with comparisons to other traditions to parts of psychology and there's practices that and reflection questions on a lot of the pages. It's really meant to be something that could be learned individually or in a partnership or in a group. And every page is, is its own world. Sounds like a workbook. Is it kind of like a manual or a, a, is it like that? It's modeled after a particular type of Jewish text uh, okay. called the Talmud, which essentially is a collection of the core teachings in the middle with commentary all around, but it can be explored. I mean, someone could literally open up a page, do some bibliomancy and, and see what's arising there, or it could be worked through one by one. And the, the most, the strongest theme throughout has to do with what you could call embodiment. It has to do with this sense of grounded spirituality, but also there's a lot about how to treat our bodies well so that they can be rela in relationship to our spirits or to the deeper parts of us, but also the way in which a spiritual experience can actually manifest as a felt experience in the body. Got what it. some people call clair sentience. There we that, go. Doors that, open. I love it. Kabbalah, one of the things it describes are these multiple layers or levels of reality. And that could be a visual quest. It could be a journey through through dimensions with, with the mind's eye or astral projection. Okay. And this form in embodied Kabbalah is journeying through the layers of reality using the felt sense in our bodies, because the principle is that our bodies are the most physical part of us. They're the most grounded. And so for people, especially who are either drawn to body centered practice or have a propensity to kind of go far out of their bodies and want to stay more present here. 
So the, the body is the vehicle is essentially the uh, the path that's that's articulated there. So do people come to you? I have so many questions for you. Oh my gosh, there's going to have to be two videos, right? There's <laughs> um, it just leads me to so many ways because there's so much in what you're saying, right? So can someone come to you? And say, you know, I'm experiencing, uh, you know, pain here, or I'm working on forgiveness, or this just this event just happened to me. And do you use your modality and to teach them how, how to do something specific through Jewish mysticism, or is it, or is it just you're healing them? So take me there. I know that's so when out I- there, but. I teach courses as well. When I teach courses, often I'm drawing more specifically on texts, you could say, on like teachings from the past and people are reflecting on that. That's sort of, let's say, one level that might be the more intellectual. It doesn't capture it because in in the Jewish tradition, studying sacred texts is a contemplative practice. And so it's sort of where the intellect meets the soul, if you will. Got it. Another level could be we could be learning something as a group and it's sometimes really evocative for people and maybe there's something that's arising that we can actually feel something in the space. And so then there could be a contemplative practice of, oh, there's, let's like feel into the moment right now. Got and it. sometimes people are feeling similar things and as they're speaking, it starts to shift and there's wisdom that can come through insights in those moments as well. And when it comes to individual work, sometimes clients, they they're having a bad day or they're, or they're having a great day or there's they're wherever they're at. It's really more about the experiential healing process in those moments. What are people noticing in their bodies or in their awareness? Let's talk about that. And it usually starts to gradually work into this body centered experiencing and just the, the, a painful experience or some sensation in the body is it's an invitation to go deeper. And it's often, I don't want to say always, but it's a pretty high percentage if someone's aligning with the practice that they will have a, an insight and experience light or something that's just coming through that starts with wherever physical sensation they, they began with. Got it. Oh, I've been on my own healing journey for so long. So I totally appreciate what you're saying to the people that you serve too. When you're working with people, Matthew, do you, you mentioned groups and I know you have an institute that you're going to tell us about a school, I'm assuming, right? So do you work on Zoom? Do you work one-on-one? If I wanted to work with you, what would that look like? Take us through how people typically get a hold of you and the benefits that they can receive in working with you. Sure. Yeah. I, so I work with people uh, one-on-one or in groups. If anyone comes to my website and they, you can send me a message through there. And that's usually how the conversation starts. I, I do a lot of advertising as well, or advertising posting on Facebook. Okay. So I have a Facebook page, Rabbi Matthew Ponak and I'll put all those links below yeah. too, so people can connect and I'll put this in the description. So people listening, everything will be in the description to connect. I love that. But I'm thinking about, again, these traditions, you know, tradition, tradition yes. right? You can't, you can't talk about Jewish mysticism without saying that in that way. <laughs> and a lot of what I'm hearing or understanding is that, um, you know, it's, it's kept a secret or you couldn't know and you had to be invited and, you know, and then you got invoked or you, and so you got educated and and here you are taking the scriptures or you wouldn't call them scriptures. You were taking the text from the studies, right. And then you're expanding on them and stuff. Right. So is it so changed? Is it so opened? Is there so many more um, acceptance? Is it, mainstream now compared to what it used to be can you take us can you bridge us there because i'm sure people like me have like so many people with their catholic religions and you know there's so many containers around that is it more open now in today's world how would you answer that i'll give you a a a very brief history of of kabbalah yeah and so let's talk about this movement that arose in the middle ages it was it was reserved for a select group, partly because it was incredibly complex and written and metaphorical. And not even if you understood the metaphors in the language, you'd still have to have the experiences to really integrate it. It was just a very inaccessible system in that sense. But over time, 
it became much more common within the Jewish world. And there were many, many, certainly learned people who were having access to it. it. Now, it was I, on some level, it was always reserved be, uh, for a select few because there is a fear. The kind of thing that happened to me at the age of 18 is one of the, the negative things that can happen if people aren't approaching mysticism in a grounded way. And that that's a danger and a reason to be cautious. And it's not a reason on its own to sh shut it off, so to speak. But the other thing that was happening is that there were these what were called false messiah movements where people would gain access to Kabbalah and would start these big public movements proclaiming themselves the messiah. And it never ended well. And this is we're talking in the 1600s, uh, 1700s. And so a lot of the authorities started to really shut it down and they started saying, you have to be 40 before you're going to learn this. And, and there were grounded approaches, but people think that that's the only way it's ever been. And it, it's not true. I So my when I work with someone, I if I don't feel like they're ready for what we're doing, I won't work with them. And I'm putting this material out there, but it's a grounded form of uh, Kabbalah. And it's intentionally written not to evoke really overwhelming experiences in people. It's more that that middle ground that yeah. we're going for. So we are in the midst of a reawakening of mysticism in the Jewish world right now in our era. The, also, the modern era, the, the like the sort of European enlightenment, the rationalism of that really tamped it down too. But there's a reemergence currently happening. So I can't speak for, you know, every Kabbalah, every Jewish mysticism teacher, but I am on the more, let's say, opening the gates end of the movement for sure. But I'm not unique in that. And it's really, a lot of people are waking up in a lot of different cultures, a lot of different worlds. And this is, this is part of that movement as well. I, that is so perfect because it lines up with really what's going on in the world or in the universe right now. We've talked a lot about this on my channel about the ascension and we're stepping into the new age. What is the new age? And we're, you know, the old world is becoming the new earth. And so in that, right, it was all predicted that we would kind of be where we are today and we have to do it together. I've said this on mm -hmm. almost the last 20 interviews. We were talking about where we are and where we're heading. So it makes sense that all of this has needed to shift and ascend to mm -hmm. this place and we need to do it together. So I think you're saying the same thing that so many other people are saying as far as how we're transcending to where we are. And I just, I love that we get to be part of that and we're bringing all this together, right? No matter what religion you're part of. And I love that you had some interest in Buddhism. Before we got on, I actually moved out Buddha. I wasn't sure if that was going to be a conflict. So I put the angel in. I have a Buddha sure. in my kitchen. Okay, too <laughs> funny. So are there other things that people listening maybe would need um, and be interested in? Well, one of my favorite teachings from this tradition, and I, again, because I'm a scholar and I've studied so many different perspectives, even from within Judaism, I I can't say much that speaks for the whole thing, yeah. but in general, the mark of a Jewish mystic is not in their spiritual attainment, so to speak. At the end of the day, it's not about their intuition. It's not about their knowledge. It's actually about their actions. That the Jewish mystic is at the end of the day is judged by how kind they are, how good they are, how they're living and showing up in the world. And that's, again, that sense of embodiment. Yeah. It's, yeah. That, the, it's the path of being the bridge between the spiritual and the physical it has everything to do with being in service to others. I, they, I did a fun little video about, are you a natural born mystic? And it had, what is it? And it really is everything you just described to be kind and loving and, and in service to others. And I mm -hmm. love and, that. And, and also not to judge people who are, <laughs> who are in process and, and are out of their bodies, let's say in a way that isn't integrated, but, it, it's part of a path. And I, I think there are many different paths in the world, but the one that I really feel most strongly about, both traditionally speaking, I guess you could say, and what I what I believe in in my own life is that is that integration piece and to to walk it and to talk it and to experience it. I think that's a that's really the the goal. I love that. So we're gonna invoke or ask or invite the people who are listening right now to Open up the door a little, lean in, as we've described in this video or this podcast, a little bit more. And I'm going to ask them to, you know, go into your website, discover a little bit more. What would you offer besides your book? 
a great tool, it sounds like. What would you offer for the people who want to learn a little bit more? Where did they start? If they were going to go to YouTube or buy a book or, you know, your website, what would be a good place for them to get a little further in and uncover whether they want to lean more into this modality? Well, I have to say there's a lot of books that I love and have learned from. If they're looking specifically for the match between somatic work and Kabbalah, there's I, I recommend my book. But if they want to look at some really expansive teachings from Kabbalah, there's a great book called God is a Verb by Rabbi mm -hmm. David Cooper. All right. And he's he's a very he was he passed away a few years ago a very gifted uh, meditator and teacher and healer and it's it's a really it's a really great book. I'll tag it in this video so people can see it and um, mm -hmm. look into that. Okay, anything else is a good start. Well, you know, I'm I'm sitting here in my office and I'm, there's a book in in front of my eyes right now, and it's not a specifically Jewish book, but it's such a great book on grounded spirituality. It's a book called Farther Shores okay. by Yvonne Casson. Y v o n n e is and k a s o n is her name, and she is a transpersonal psychologist and a psychiatrist. And it was her book, in fact, many years ago, that really, really helped me understand what it meant to be in balance between the earthly and the transcendent. So between those two books, uh, that's a really great start. And and uh, yeah, there's there's really so many more to look at, but. Those those are fantastic resources for introductory. Right. We'll call those tools to help other people get started. So it sounds wonderful. We're kind of wrapping up. I don't want to overwhelm people with our beautiful information today. When you knew I was going to interview you today and I was excited to meet and you were excited to share your modality, have I missed anything or is there anything that you wanted to make sure got said on this interview, this would be your chance to go there. There's there's a type of practice within Kabbalah that is, I believe would be really interesting uh, to your listeners. Okay. And it's a type of Hebrew letter divination, if you will. There's a that's divination in the sense of uncovering the mysteries of something. Got it. Like the I Ching, but yeah. in in this form, it's looking at every Hebrew letter has a meaning, and it also has a numerical value. And so you can actually look at which words, if you add them up, equal which other words. And this is the kind of thing I would only recommend if someone feels grounded, but it's a really expansive practice. It could also be done in English, in fact. It's called gematria. Okay. E-M-A-T-R-I-A. -E and it you look very common teachings on this. So the word echad means one. And that equals the number 13, which, by the way, isn't an unlucky number in Judaism. 13 is a lucky number. And the word for love, ahava, also equals 13. And so the word for one and the word for love have the same numerical value. Got so it. it's understood that to be loving is to be unified or be, to be connecting with someone. And if you take those two words and put them together, they equal the number 26, which is the numerical value of the most sacred name of God in Judaism, the ineffable name, the the sort of the one that's often translated as my Lord in English, but it's really without pronunciation beyond words, and it equals one and love put together. Oh my gosh. Now, are these cards or books or I how how do you how do you dabble in this specific practice? Well, I'm going to be teaching about it uh, this summer, for example. Here we are. It's uh, in February right now, and we're recording. And this summer in June, I'm going to be teaching about it. You could actually look up that word I just spelled out online as well. And yeah. there, are, there are resources available. And it's about looking at the the, the numerical value and, and and doing some of those combinations. It is fun. It's it's I consider it an, a type of art uh, and less less of a science, if you will. But I... I encourage people to to find resources around and, and play around think, with it. I think it sounds like a follow-up interview. Teach people more about specifically about this. I love the fact that you're teaching this. Can people follow this class on Zoom or, or is it only going to be yeah, in person? It's going to be online uh, and information will be coming out uh, on my website and in uh, through my mailing list as well. Perfect. Well, I'll make sure all that again gets put into here and I'll have some nice slides for people who are watching to line up with that visually. So I really appreciate that. 
I think that kind of leads us into, you know, where we're heading next? <laughs> yes. Do you know? The music just kicked up. We're heading into rapid fire. This is where I get to ask you really fun questions. People get to know you a little bit better. And also my chance to say thank you so much for being flexible in our time today and learning more about you. You have amazing energy. I keep You're going to get some beautiful connections, I hope, with my tribe to yours because you're just a warm, kind person. So I think more people are going to be reaching out to you. I know I am. <laughs> So let's do this beautiful rapid fire. My first question is, if you have a favorite movie, share that with us today. I really like Pulp Fiction. Okay, I love Tarantino. Oh, there we go. (laughs) If you were going to change the world today, the world needs what in order to be changed? The world needs very healing, intentional rest and learning how to unplug and be refreshed, otherwise known as Shabbat in Hebrew, or you could call it oasis time. We need oasis time in our lives. That was for me. Thank you for that direct message. I heard it loud and clear. We all have pet peeves. What would be a good pet peeve for you? I am a neat and tidy person and I'm also busy. And so I, I, it's for me, an untidy space affects my, my sense of contentment, whether in my office or at home. Got it. Oh my God. Really we have time more in common it. than you know. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we all have beautiful qualities that we love about ourselves. We're not great about sharing those with the world, but you know, today, what do you love about yourself, Matthew? I think what's coming up for me is, is in integrity. I really, I really strive to do my best and tend to be a good, honest person and to, to heal relationships if they've been wounded. And then the last question before we say goodbye, what are you doing when you're experiencing joy? I am eating delicious food and singing songs while having no electronic devices around with friends and family at my home. Totally present, it sounds like, right? I love that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening and watching. All the links will be in this beautiful video and podcast. We appreciate you belonging today, and we will see you again next video. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Bye now.